reason to believe that they could bounce back. With Dillard, my reasoning behind him is actually, I actually have I have reason to think he might not be able to bounce back. I'd be happy for him to prove me wrong, for him to have a good game. Welcome into the Hot Read Podcast. I'm your host, Easton Freeze, director of published content here at BroadwaySportsMedia.com. We're also brought to you by the 440 Podcast Network. You can follow me on social media at Easton Freeze. I'm joined as always by producer JT, who you can follow on social media at JT underscore Runky. JT, how are you? Back at Boom Boss Pizza, live here in Spring. Yeah, excited. Uh, happy Thursday to us, Friday when this goes live on our uh, recording, and it is officially our our long-awaited rivalry, rivalry, rivalry week, week once it is. again. So I'm excited to be here talking this Bengals and Titans matchup. Three years on the show running, yes. Titans and Bengals have faced each other. And uh, two of the past three, or actually three of the past three, the Bengals have come out on top and the Titans have left underwhelmed. And we, uh, we're going to talk about why that might be the case this week and why it might not be. Reviewing everything Titans Bengals ahead of Sunday's matchup at Nissan Stadium. Before we do, got to tell you about our wonderful and amazing sponsors here at Boomba's Pizza. Three locations in the Middle Tennessee area here in Spring Hill, where we're live each and every Thursday. Also in East Nashville and in Murfreesboro, wherever you are in the Middle Tennessee area, you'll find a Boomba's Pizza. And they are fantastic at what they do. What they do is make delicious craft pizza and have a fantastic selection of beers on tap for you. Uh, we have not had anything to drink yet today, but I know that once we are done here, We'll be heading to the bar to watch Thursday night football. Packers, Lions should be a much more uh, engaging episode of Thursday night football as compared to what we saw last week with the Giants and the Niners. I'm actually looking forward to this game. I think it'll be a, a telling game. I think it should be a pretty tight game. And we may even be betting on that game later in the best bet gauntlet. We'll have to see. Um, but Boomba's Pizza is great. You got to check it out wherever you are. Also in Indiana and Kentucky, if you're from out of town. There's Boomba's Pizza all around this area, and we cannot wait to uh, have as many of you come throughout the season as you possibly can to come hang out with us. We're doing gift card giveaways most weeks, I believe. So if you're the first person to come in to the Spring Hill Boomba's location, come shake our hands. Say, what's up? Hello, fan of the show, or hello, I hate the show, or hi, I I'm, I'm vaguely familiar with who you are and what you're doing here. We'll be happy to provide you with a gift card. You can have free food and drinks. I mean, what? Well, Shouldn't have to sell that much more than that, JT. No, not at all. Get in your car, travel to Boomba's Pizza in Spring Hill, and get free food and, and watch Thursday Night Football on one of the 347 TVs in this in this uh, restaurant. So that is something that you should do. And we still, today, uh, kind of a slower day out here. I, the traffic in the Nashville area has been kind of so bad, kind today. Of bad today. It took, me, it took us both about twice as long as it typically does to get down here from the Nashville area. Now that rush hour is over, hop in your car, come on down. That gift card is still up for grabs. Um, if you're watching with us live, by the way, today, appreciate you being in here. I know that Titans fans, I can sense amongst the fan base some fatigue this week. I can sense there's a lot of folks losing interest in wanting to talk about week three, wanting to look forward to what this team can do um, this week and through the rest of the season and I know that there's a lot of reason for folks to not be as jazzed about this team as they were three weeks ago. I'm not somebody that jumps to conclusions within the first month of the season. I've seen far too many bad teams in September end up being good teams in December and vice versa. So I really just, I think that September and October are about staying afloat. And as long as the Titans can do that, that is the bar. You know, you can't be one in five. It, no team in NFL history has gone one and five for the first six games and made the playoffs. So you've got to stay afloat. They need to win at least one, probably two or three more games before they get to their bye in week seven. But assuming they do that, I'm I'm not super worried about this team. I, I'm I'm less looking for wins and more looking to see positive momentum week after week. And obviously last week was a a, a big setback in that department. But I do want to talk about the differences between that Browns team and this Bengals team. And so let's dive into that, JT. Um, some stats and info ahead of this game that I want to lay out for folks. It, it's kind of shocking to see how few yards of total offense this Titans team has through three games. Just 720. I believe the, the league leaders, the Miami Dolphins, have something in the 
18 or 1900 yard <laughs> category. It's something way up there as certainly, well. It certainly will, will, will do that when you score 70 points. It's hard <laughs> to not have many yards of offense when you score 70 points in a game. Yeah. Um, but despite the Titans only having 720 yards total offense this season, you go and you look at where the Bengals are sitting and they are just three or excuse me, 13 yards better, 733 total yards of offense for them. This is, I think, pretty easily, in my opinion, the worst version of the Bengals the Titans have seen in the past. This will be their fourth meeting. I think that this is the worst version of Joe, Joe Burrow. It's certainly worse than he was the past two years. I'd say even worse than the, the rookie version that they saw three week, three years ago. That game uh, as, as his rookie season was kind of his coming out game, kind of his here's Joe Burrow, look at what he can do when given time to operate. He can slice and dice you up. And and that was something where um, it, it's kind of the case with a lot of Titans games. Yeah. You know, like with Deshaun last week, it's like a welcome back to the league. Deshaun may have been fixed by the Titans defense. That was kind of what the Bengals and Joe Burrow did three years ago. I think that that was a better version of Joe Burrow we're seeing, than we're seeing right now. And that, that's only because of his injury situation. Had that calf pop very early on in August, I believe, very towards the beginning of training camp. The took, first week. Yeah, okay, so I'm right about it being early, and then he takes all of training camp off with rest, comes back for week one. Week one and two, he looks fine, tweaks it at the end of that week two game, was very much a question mark going into the Monday Night Football game last week. When you listen to Bengals folks in the media market talk about it, it sounded like up until Saturday of last week, people were pretty sure it was going to be Jake Browning. It was going to be Joe Burrow taking the week off because they were afraid that he'd really – suffered a significant setback with that calf. He ends up getting back to serviceable movement ability quicker than, than many imagined. And he goes in that game from what we heard from him after that game. And from what we've seen from him in the injury report this week, it, it sounds like he didn't suffer any kind of setback in that Monday night game. And so what you saw Monday night is probably what you're going to see again this week from him mobility wise. They've been running 99.99% of snaps out of the shotgun. They do not want him taking um, many steps <laughs> backwards or at all in True. the pocket. Yes. They, I think they rolled him out once on Monday night in, in a bootleg. Like he, he has as, as much of a statue as you may ever see Joe Burrow unless he plays until he's 45 years old. And that presents a very different kind of challenge for the Titans defense and for their pass rush that needs a get right game this week, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, some more stats for you per ESPN stats and information. The Bengals are allowing the NFL high 10 yards per pass attempt with the Titans right on their tail at 9.7 yards per pass attempt. The Titans have allowed 12 completions of 20 plus yards tied for the sixth mo most. And just for reference, the Titans and the Chargers, former Titans uh, opponent from this year, they've allowed a league high four completions of 40 plus yards this season. The Bengals pass defense has been allowing these chunk plays. The Titans have been trying to rip off. Now, we've talked this week about how the Titans have gone too much into the try to run the ball and try to take shots downfield. They've eliminated the middle class in their passing game of taking short to intermediate shots and trying to slice and dice a defense. They have to get back to that. But if they are wanting to still take those shots downfield, which I don't see why they shouldn't, it's worked for them three times in the uh, really you could argue that DeAndre Hopkins catch in the, in the Browns game, maybe four times in the past two games, they should continue to try to do that. And against this team so far this season, teams have been able to do that. Um, and so with that JT, let's talk about something that I, I heard from Ryan Tannehill on Wednesday at, at his press availability with us before we dive into the, the specifics of this Bengal Bengals game. I, don't, I, I rarely talk about the Tannehill pressers on the, our Thursday preview show because I, it's kind of old news by then, and he doesn't always say anything of much import. He's very good at the coach QB speak. But on Wednesday, he was pretty accepting of the fact, in my opinion. I was talking to our buddy Sam Phelan about this after the press conference. He seemed pretty reticent, pretty accepting of the fact that his offensive line is not great, and there is nothing he can do about it. It was it was very much a this is who I've got energy from him when asked about his offensive line. You know, he was asked about what he feels he can do to motivate his offensive line, help his offensive line get you know. And, and in the past, when he's had that had, had that kind of question, it's been a lot of, you know, those guys are battling up there. They you know they are they are winning some, they're losing some. That wasn't really the vibe on Wednesday. It was kind of like you know I just I have to make do with what I've got from him which is surprising and 
honest and accurate because we know his offensive line right now is doing him no favors. The age old adage that I, I've continued to think about this week. And I think it, it, it rings very true with this Titans team. It rang very true with last year's Titans team. You just can't have two bad tackles and you can talk till the cows come home about how you've got to slide protection the way of Andre Dillard. Well, if you do that, then you, you're taking away protection from Chris Hubbard and he's not good enough to be left on an Island. Back and forth, you know, oh, you, you got a chip on, on these plays. When you're in the red zone, you can't let Miles Garrett come clean around the corner. We can talk about the specifics like that all day long. At the end of the day, it's just impossible offensively in the modern NFL to get away with having two bad tackles. You have to have at least one guy who you can trust with some kind of regularity, some kind of certainty to leave on an island on key plays against some of the better pass rushers in the NFL and for him not to get schooled. The Titans just don't really have that right now with the level that these guys are playing at. And there's a video from today's press conferences with offensive coordinator Tim Kelly that I wanted to play. He was asked about if last week the Cleveland pass rush and the success they were having against the Titans offensive line was a big limiter in the, the his ability to play call plays um, in that game, you know, the, the variety with, with which he wanted to play call, maybe the, the game plan that he came into the game, having to scrap some of that, how much of the offensive line success, offensive uh, line lack of success for the Titans uh, impacted his play calling ability. And he keyed in on how, no matter how the offensive line plays, no matter how the defensive line they're facing plays, if they are getting themselves into second and third and long, whether that is taking sacks, whether it is uh, blown assignments on the offensive line, whether it is pre-snap penalties, which we've talked about earlier this season. They they just can't do that and be efficient and effective. Let's listen to what he had to say. You know, it, the, the, it definitely limits what's going on. You know, the, the more limiting factor ends up being, being second and 12 and being in third long. Like that's, again, I, I hope this is the last time I have to say that, but if, if we're living in that world, it's, it, we're, it's going to be hard. I don't care who you have blocking up front. Like, that that's hard. Um, those guys are pinning their ears back. They're, they don't have to worry about you know any, any type of run game in that situation, um, and, and they're getting you know they're they're, they're able to go rush the passer, which is what they get you know paid to do and, and work all day on it. So we got to do a better job of staying out of those situations. So, the so the big topic I want to get into today, JT, and this is the discussion I want us to have in this game: who needs a big bounce back performance the most? And I put out a Twitter poll about this earlier today. I asked a bounce back performance from which Titans unit would be the most likely to result in a win against the Bengals. And the three units that I offered as options were the offensive line, the cornerbacks, or the, the, the secondary, and the defensive line and the, the Titans' pass rush. The results of that poll weren't surprising to me. 67% of the almost 600 people that voted said offensive line was the, the biggest need in terms of a bounce-back game. And I, I can't disagree with folks there, just because if if – Ryan Tannehill is, is being pressured in the way that he was in Cleveland this weekend or against Cincinnati, then it the offense will be non-viable. Once again, it will always be non-viable that way with Ryan Tannehill being immobile at his age with this offense's need to be efficient. Uh, that's fine and good. But I want to make the argument on today's show that only one of these three groups, the offensive line, the secondary, and the defensive front has ever done something has ever given you a reason for you to actually put significant faith in them and the good news is because of that they have the capability to win this game i think with a standout performance but we haven't seen it in two weeks and it's the titans pass rush they were hectic in new orleans they made that game close they did a lot of great things arden key flashed in his first game as a titan all of that. Danico Autry was fantastic. Since then, it's been relatively quiet. Justin Herbert, very good at navigating the pocket and in the quick passing game. Deshaun Watson last week, they had their hands on him a number of times. There were at least three or four sacks in that game that were there for the taking, and Deshaun Watson, being the wizard in the pocket that he's always been, managed to escape those. This week against Joe Burrow, it's nothing like that. The only defense Joe Burrow has against the Titans' pass rush this week is his prowess in the short and quick passing game. And he's fantastic at that before he got hurt. He was fantastic. 
impact killed them is they the, the Bengals have been able to mitigate the effect of the Titans pass rush with how fast they get the ball out. They need that now more than ever against this Titans team because Joe Burrow is, dare I say, more of a statue back there than Ryan Tannehill is right now because of that injury. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with you. I, I, I think that when you, when you break it down, that is the most important this week. I also think that, to your point, I think a, a bounce back week from the secondary as well, I think that's going to be, that would be my pick of it so I, th- I think we have titans fans who obviously think the offensive line needs to get better you were making it this- does all three of these i mean like no, it, it's not do. like yes. a you should only hope for one bounce back Choose all one. three yeah, of these yeah. groups should be better um, <laughs> need to be better but like the titans offensive line certainly they think that against this uh this Bengals uh defensive line which is sneaky like one of the top groups in the league and then i don't think they're talked about just because of the the name factor isn't really there for a lot of those guys sure. um the offensive line does have a it does have a really big challenge ahead i think the biggest challenge though that we cannot continue to overlook is the secondary matchup that guys like christian fulton and Sean Murphy Bunting and the entire group they're going to have in this like three headed monster of Jamar Chase, T Higgins and Tyler Boyd. Sure. I mean, listen, I, um, I'm actually relatively confident in the abilities of Roger McCreary and Sean Murphy Bunting to be just fine. Uh, the guy that I'm <laughs> the guy that I have no confidence yeah, in I, yeah. is Christian Fulton. And if the Bengals are wise, they will just target whoever he is on until he can prove that he can do anything, but yes. be, allowing perfect pass ratings against him when targeted so far this season, which yes. is what he's done. Um, I, I think that Sean Murphy Bunting and McCreary will have a better game or not better, just a good game against who they're facing because they have been sneaky good this year. The more I watch of them on film, the more I am impressed by them. And the more I watch of Christian Fulton, the more I am completely befuddled by his performance so far. And um, that's how I think the Bengals will probably come out like the way that we saw the Chargers target Trey Avery, just pick on him relentlessly in that game in the short passing game in, in week two against the Chargers. I would not surprise me at all to see them do that pretty exclusively against Trey Avery when he's out there, but against Christian Fulton, who's going to be out there for most of the snaps. Now, maybe you get a short leash Xavier Newman Johnson situation and final. Like, I don't think either of us are anticipating the Titans yanking, you know, giving Christian Fulton the hook soon. But I think we also both agree that they should if it continues to be this bad. Maybe they surprise us. Maybe they do. But assuming they don't, he's out there and they're letting him battle and try to figure it out. The Bengals are probably going to pick on him with that short passing game. Some stats on that short passing game real quick, and then I want to hear your thoughts. Next Gen Stats uh, says that the, the Bengals' average air yards per attempt through three games this season is just two yards. So it truly is dump off city for a guy that's desperately trying not to get hit or have to navigate the pocket back there in the pass protection game. The Bengals have a rookie left guard in Cordell Volson who we covered in the spring last week against Aaron Donald in prime time. He put up a very impressive, I mean, genuinely impressive 0.0 pass blocking grade. According to PFF, that'll happen against Aaron Donald. But but zero point is like, you know, if you told me he had a 32.7, I'd be like, yeah, it's, you know, that's Aaron Donald. What are you going to do as a rookie? Zero point zero literally never did anything positive. Yes. It was all it was. It was truly every snap he was getting cooked. Jeffrey Simmons is a step down from Aaron Donald. But how big of one? I don't know. And I think Coral Volson versus Jeffrey Simmons will be a maybe deciding factor in this game. I was going to say not not even just. uh um, Simmons, but a Jeff Simmons who kind of is angry at the world because of uh, events yes. that we we can we can lightly just say happened and like. But this is a dude that is looking to bounce back He's for been sure. Pissed off for greatness this week, yes, for he sure. He he um, talked to us in the media. We can't say this part. He's been very adamant about how we've just got to find a way to win. Yes, this guy he, is desperate and he, hungry for a win. And and I think that he that. While the the player Aaron Donald and and Jeffrey Simmons are maybe t- not talent wise there, I think the emotional part of this game, especially for Jeff Simmons to get this defensive line back on track, mm-hmm. puts him pretty close. Like and he's this- had a pretty quiet two games in a yes. row now. Not that he's been bad on tape. You can actually see he the, the box score scouting of Jeffrey Simmons through the past two games doesn't tell the full picture. He's actually been quite good, but he's not been a- affecting the quarterback. At, you know when when. when when, when it comes down to brass tacks, yes. he's not been getting home. Yes. And so that's something that I think that he'll look to do this week. 
um, a, a number of guys up front. I mean, like we, we, we saw with Danico Autry, fantastic in week one. He's been nursing a bit of an injury recently, but not been super effective since then. Um, Harold Landry has not, you know, we've not been expecting much from him coming off of the ACL, but he's not done a whole lot of anything. And, uh, you know, who, who else? Who, who am I missing here? Autry. Oh, uh, uh, Autry and then um, I've named three guys. Yeah, who's the, yeah, there's another one. The other guy that's next to Autry in the middle there. Oh, Tier Tart. Tier that's Tart. What I'm that's Tier Tart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm, I'm totally spaced out. Tier Tart has had a relatively quiet couple games. Yes. So I, in the middle, Tier Tart could also be somebody that that keys in on Cordell Volsom, makes his life hell. He's been pretty fantastic. Um, all of that being said, oh, and Arden Key. Uh, Arden yes. Key's it had a very fantastic week one, and then since then has been pretty quiet. He actually said Arden in the in the locker room this week, talked about how Joe Burrow is the best he thinks the Titans have seen so far at getting the ball out quickly. And he feels like they have to make sure they get their hands up to knock the ball down at the offensive line because they may truly not have time to get home. You know, 1.5, two seconds to get home. It's just you're not gonna you're not gonna get after the quarterback that way if they're getting it out that quickly. But the good news is you're not getting it downfield. You don't have these. There are no long developing plays. I, I, I saw it. I wish I'd written it down. On Monday Night Football, they threw up a stat mid-game about how the Bengals had hit on like three of their 15 or 16 attempts downfield, and they had a very low, long develop, mid to long developing play rate. And so that's something that I don't expect to change with this Titans team because, again, Joe Bro just does not have the ability to buy time, and they do not want him getting dirty back there. Do we want to talk more about the, the the general offensive line versus defensive line battle, or can we dive into? I have a couple of guys in particular, three guys highlighted that I want to dive into as needing a big bounce back, and I want to talk about whether we think that they can or not. Yeah, I think the the last point on that is the, to Arden's point. Like this Bengals team so far has seen a very different look from from past seasons. This Bengals team. The, is, is kind of moved in a direction, whether it was planned or not, because of Joe Burrow's injury, that we're not seeing like Jamar Chase absolutely feast downfield uh, like he has in the past. Like he, he's not this explosive guy because they have to get the ball out really, really quickly, and so that's what they've been doing. Um, they have um, really just dumped it off to Jamar Chase mm -hmm. and, and the, like Tyler Boyd and a lot of these guys to have him make plays yards after the catch. And I'm curious to see how they use Chase because I'm rem I was reminded earlier today. I, I was surprised that I went this long in the week without realizing this. Last last year, a, a big talking point going into the Bengals Titans game was that Jamar Chase was not going to play. That Joe Mixon was not going to play. It was going to need to be a T Higgins step up for us game. It was going to need to be a Samaj P Ryan step up for us game. To their credit, both of those guys went off. They were fantastic. As you mentioned earlier in the year, Samaj P Ryan maybe has been the most successful running back the Titans have faced in the past like 17 consecutive games he's not there but joe mixon's back jamar chase is back they they've been fine i mean like joe mixon had, had a, a i think his best game of the year last last week jamar chase has been limited but i, I want to say yeah, and he did get a, he did catch 11 balls so he, like he, he was he did but his, his effectiveness has been limited based on what we expect simply because they're not able to let him develop like yes. down his, his downfield threat ability has been limited by and the situation. yeah and i do and i do question back to that point where they are just not finding success downfield i have to maybe point out that it could also be because t higgins currently has the butteriest hands of all time right now. I mean, he's at, he's he's had at he least eight, he's right had now, at least yeah. eight targets in all three games, and he has a thirty six percent catch rate right now with, with that. So it's, it, not, it's not it's not like they're not trying to right. throw the ball downfield. It's just they are. Just T Higgins can't catch the ball right now, right. and so that is something I'm also with this with these um, wide receivers. I'm looking to see possibly change this week. All right, three guys that I want to dive into specifically this week. What we need to see from them, but, but before we get into that, if you are not subscribed to our YouTube channel at Probably Sports Media on YouTube, we would love for you to subscribe. We see the metrics. There's a lot of you that watch and you aren't subscribed. I know that that's an accident on your part. We we know you don't mean it. <laughs> Just go hit that subscribe button. It is in fact free for you, which is the awesome part, and it helps us out tremendously. So do us a personal favor: subscribe at Probably Sports Media on youtube we're trying to get that subscriber count up if you enjoy the show even if you just listen to the podcast version you're never even on youtube just do us a like you know again it's it's free it takes you 10 seconds go open your youtube app search broadway sports media hit subscribe appreciate you for doing that the three guys that need a big week this week and it's it's two guys from the groups we just talked about and then one in the receiving core and i'll let you, i'll give you three guesses as to who that might be and two of them don't 
Um, let's start with the guy who has been the worst player on the starting lineup for the Titans, and we've talked about relentlessly, but I want to talk about just once more briefly. Andre Dillard, Titans left tackle. I, I Before we dive into the spe- specifics on him, because he is going to play in this game, he's, in my opinion, going to be the Titans starting left tackle for the foreseeable future. I, I have no faith in them making a move, and certainly not anytime soon. That being said, I, and you to an extent, this show has been a big proponent of giving Peter Skaronsky a chance on the outside at the tackle position in the NFL since April, since we were in Indianapolis talking about this at a table set up just like this with our buddy Nick Suss from the Tennessean. We had an entire episode we called The Great Tackle Debate where we discussed Paris Johnson Jr. and Peter Skaronsky as potential NFL tackles. I think that he deserves a shot. I think that they need, in my opinion, he is the best tackle prospect, yeah, prospect the best tackle option they have on this team right now, left tackle option. He plays with much better strength and technique than Andre Dillard has. He has much better anchor than Andre Dillard has. He's not had the arms or the reach that Andre Dillard has, but frankly, the arms and his reach for Dillard has not been doing anything for him right now. I, I have more faith when, and this is all asterisk, like when he gets back and healthy, because right now, our, our, you know, we understand he had a ruptured appendix emergency situation. He's going into this would be the third consecutive game he's missed this week. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Three. Yes. He played week one. This will be his third missed game. Maybe he's back for the fourth. Based on what I'm hearing and seeing, just the vibe, I'm kind of thinking that maybe he comes back for week six. And if not in London, maybe they give him after until the bye. Like I think that after the bye, maybe a real possibility. There's a large range of outcomes for a, a ruptured. Um, did I say Achilles earlier? No, I think you said uh, so, I, 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 I thought, uh, yeah. Okay. It would have sounded weird. It would have sounded, yeah, it would have sounded weird. A ruptured appendix. Um, we've seen guys come back within a week. We've seen guys take a month and a half off. With offensive linemen, I want to say it's probably more difficult, more detrimental to getting back because of the weight factor. These offensive linemen, how often do you see a guy retire and then they balloon down and you're like, oh, that's the size that this person is supposed to, like that's the way that God intended them to look. And, uh, you know, they've just been nutritionisting their way to being 315 pounds in the NFL. Skaronsky is a big fella. Do not get me wrong. But right now, when we saw him in the locker room this week, the brain trust of me and Nick Suss and Sam Phelan, our carnival barker. You've ever been to a carnival and they're like, ma'am, step on. I can guess within five pounds of your weight. Step yes. on this. Our best guess playing carnival barker was that he's probably at about 295 ish, somewhere between 290, 300. He was listed before the season at 313, if I'm not mistaken. So we think he's probably, he says himself he's lost weight. I'm guessing he's probably he's lost got a heavy 20, appendix. 20. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, get, you know, getting that weight back has got to be difficult. In addition to just getting back, you know, you lose some conditioning. Some, yes. you, you're stagnant for a couple of weeks. You got to get back up. You, you've only played one NFL game. A lot of people say you got to play yourself into shape sometimes in the NFL. He's not had that opportunity. So all of those factors come together to me to say, don't be surprised if he's not back before after the buy and in week eight. So back to Dillard. Now, now that I've, I've made it clear once again, I feel like every show I have to put out there, they should try Skaronsky at left tackle. They can't right now, but when he comes back, I'm going to be arguing every week that they should with Dillard who they're going to rock and roll with right now. And I don't think they're going to put Raidens out there. Maybe if you have a three sack half from Dillard, like, you know, you come out and Dillard allows three sacks against the Bengals by halftime. Which I think is Bengals, possible. It, it is on, because, it's on the table. And, and it, with Dillard, Trey it's Hendrickson, not, it is on yes, the table. <laughs> it, 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 with Dillard, it, it doesn't seem like it's up and down. It's, it, it really, the first, I think the first drive matters the most for him. He is such a, a player that, that is, it's so pivotal for him to get off on the good, like a good foot uh, yeah. in the games because it, for whatever reason, it's just hard for him to like rebound, you know? Well, to that point, and I have this written out in my notes about Dillard. I, I, I talked to you earlier this week that I was reminded about a conversation that, that I and friend of the show, Teron Davenport over at ESPN had early on. I, I went and found the text conversation. It was August 5th. We were talking about this during the beginning portions of training camp. Andre Dillard has all of the talent to be fine. He's lacking in play strength, like I said. He's he's got some flexibility issues when he's trying to to operate downfield as a as a run blocker or trying to deal with the particularly bendy pass rusher. But he's an above average athlete. He's got really light feet. There's a reason why he was a first overall or for first round prospect in the NFL draft. The big issue with him, according to 
what Teron and I came to a conclusion on, just kind of reading the tea leaves, talking to him a number of times. From what I've heard, I heard Greg Cosell of NFL Films parrot this this week. I've heard a number of coaches and former scouts talk about this. This is a hi. How are you? Uh, we are live here at Boombuzz. Um, <laughs> he's somebody that lacks some some mental competitiveness, and I, I kind of hesitate to say that because I don't I don't know the guy like a coach would know him. I don't know the guy like a you know a friend would know him. So I'm not trying to besmirch him in any way. But from what I've heard from a number of sources and a number of people that know this league better than me, know this game better than me, know him better than me, it sounds like he's just not the most mentally tough guy, which, first of all, does not fit on a Mike Vrabel team. But also, when you're playing the tackle position, mental toughness is so important because it's such an up-and-down position. You can come out, and in the first series, you know it's a three-and-out on your shoulders in particular because you, you allowed a massive third-down sack. It's all your fault. You've got to bounce back from that. You've got to have the mental toughness to put that behind you. It's kind of like the best golfers will tell you. You know, you got to play hole to hole. You have a terrible hole, you've got to forget about it. You have a great hole, you've got to forget about it. With a with the tackle, of all the line positions on either side of the ball, you can swing a game more than anybody else. And so you've got to have a goldfish memory. And he just doesn't seem to have that. He's such a streaky player. The way that he approaches the game, his body language, his mentality, you know, after – we talked to him after good practices in training camp. We talked to him after bad practices in training camp, juxtaposing those two attitudes from him. He just doesn't seem between the ears to be a, a very strong mental player. That's a huge issue for this team. And for him, because he's off to such a bad start, one would think it's difficult for him to come back and climb out of that hole. And we've not seen anything from him really through three games to indicate he has that fight, that dog to come back. So I don't think it's going to be great. I think Trey Hendrickson, the, the pass rusher for the Bengals, who, like you mentioned earlier, does not get the name recognition, does not get the play that he deserves. I think a big part of that is because I was listening to some Bengals media this week. He's not a very good run defender. Like people, I, I heard one person in, in Bengals media, I think Joe Goodbury, yeah. uh, talk about how they sometimes refer to him as, as um, blackout Trey. Like he just, he just goes blackout mode, see ball, hit ball, run, get after the quarterback. And the Bengals don't really care because he's such a good pass rusher, like fine, whatever. But teams historically have had some success running at him. And um, because of that, I think that you might see some more of the running game trying to be established by the Titans team this week. Um, but, but yeah, I think Dillard's going to struggle against him as a pass rusher. I don't know. Uh, ultimately, uh, these other two guys we're going to talk about, I have things to, to tell you to be like, here's reason for hope. Here's reason to believe that they can bounce back. With Dillard, my reasoning behind him is actually, I actually have I have reason to think he might not be able to bounce back. I'd be happy for him to prove me wrong, for him to have a good game. Watching the coaches this week in in uh, at the Titans facility during practice, they're coaching him up hard. I just don't know if it's going to pay dividends in any way. Yeah, I mean, I... It it, and I agree, and I don't think we will know. I, I think this, like you said, this is the kind kind of current situation that the Titans are in that I don't think they they move past him right now. Like they don't this, have a like. What's the options? Yeah. We've discussed this. There's not really great options. It, it, but like you said, if this continues, like I just to bring it full circle, like with MPF back and maybe with Skaronsky coming back after right. the bye, if that is how long it takes him, like I think maybe then you start to see maybe a change. Agreed. Let's talk about Christian Fulton now. Um, I was listening to our buddy James Foster, friend of the show, No Flags Film, uh, A to Z Film Room on, on YouTube. He did a review through three weeks of the Titans team, individual players, talking about guys that have been really good, really bad on YouTube. I recommend you go check it out. Um, but he was talking about Christian Fulton and uh, something I, I texted him about this as I'm like, this made me chuckle. He said at one point, talking about Christian Fulton, that you have to go back to the Parrish Cox, Bleedy Ray Wilson days to find a two-game stretch worse than this out of a Titans cornerback. If you're familiar with who I'm talking about as a Titans fan, you know what kind of indictment that is. Christian Fulton has been plain horrible. And I'm not, I'm not here to beat, beat the dead horse. We've talked about the numbers. He's been really bad. They've objectively been outlier performances for him. As frustrating as he has been for the Titans and Titans fans through three or four se four seasons now with the Titans, it, it, he's been the best corner when he's healthy and on the field up until this season. That's been 
the opposite of the case. So I don't think it's unreasonable to expect some regression to the mean. Is it unreasonable maybe at this point to expect him to be a net positive player? Maybe. Maybe he's just cooked. I think there's no way he gets – combining the fact that he's been so bad to start the year with the fact that he's guaranteed to miss at least three or four games of the year with soft tissue injuries, he's not getting another contract with the team. Maybe – Maybe it's like a prove it deal, one year thing where he can't find a, a massive contract on the market. But um, in this final year, I think that he will regress to the mean. I think that he will get better because he almost has to. Do you think that's crazy for me to expect him to be better? Again, relative word. Better does not mean good. It just means not an active detriment. Liability. Yeah, active liability. liability. Um, yeah. It. it and, and I did watch that video as well. Um, it was a good video. I recommend highly. Uh, James, what he's doing James over there. knows what he's talking about. He knows what he's mm -hmm. talking about. Um, yeah, because that's just like, it, like you said, this is not the normal Christian Fulton. Like, it, it, and the play right now, he, he's not exactly getting super targeted. Like, they're no one's, they're not really, they're not on picking him, on him yet. But when, I mean, when he does change. get targeted, <laughs> right. that's, that's the problem. So, like, they, they, other teams are still like scheming him as like, it's more pivotal misses than it is consistent. Yes. It's 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 you're right that it's less Trey Avery getting targeted 15 times against the Chargers and more, you know, you're getting targeted two or three times a game, but it's for 35 and 47 yards and a touchdown and it's a disaster and it's like you, they need it. This is what your cornerback won for. This is what you're supposed to be getting paid cornerback one money for is to be that guy in this moment against one of the better receivers on the team and he's he's cons I can't name a single time he has been there to make a play yes. he's, he's sometimes not even in the frame of the television <laughs> um the la any more thoughts on fold before we move on i was to just gonna guy? say if, yeah. if there is one if there is one day or one game where he would be able to bounce back it's got to be this one this week with probably his biggest challenge that he's faced so far in this wide receiver core mm -hmm. and it, to that point like you were saying if if the the mean of Christian Fulton maybe regresses to more where, okay, they are starting to pick on him a little bit. He is um, losing some of these battles, but he eliminates the big play ability. I think that's a good start for him. To, well, to and this eliminate. just dawned on me now that you're saying that. Maybe this is a good get-right spot for him in the sense that this year, like, like we said, it's been the big play downfield shot chunk plays where he has given up a lot and cost the team dearly. Because the Bengals' pass protection has not been very great, and because Joe Burrow is getting the ball out incredibly quickly with two two yards average downfield um, down, downfield yardage per attempt this season, maybe this is the game where he's not being asked to cover a guy for a long time downfield. He can play more aggressive, play more loose, play more in the face, maybe play more press man in this game, and it's a get right spot for him in the sense that it's maybe an you know, it's a more difficult assignment based on the players he's guarding, but it's an easier assignment in the sense that he's being asked to cover for two, two and a half seconds on short in breaking routes, not long developing plays downfield. It wouldn't shock me if maybe that's what you see from this game. And it's like, we're talking on Sunday, even win or lose from like, great. At least Christian Fulton had a better game. You know, he allowed two, uh, two catches on six attempts for 27 yards and no touchdowns, you know, like, Maybe we're seeing Christian Fulton figure it out. It, will that be maybe a little bit misleading if that's the case? And the numbers for downfield passing and time to throw aren't changed for the Bengals? Yes, I would argue that it will be um, because they, they, we've not we didn't see him address his actual issue this season. But I think that that could be a get right spot and is a, a good point there. Traylon Brooks is the last guy I want to talk about before we get to the news. Really disappointing start based on what we were expecting from him coming into this year, a ton of talk from us and from everybody in the media going into the season, breakout season for Traylon Burks and for Chica Conquo, but to a lesser extent, you know, he's also not been great, but, but again, Traylon Burks is the, the X factor here that you need to be great. I also, I also think that Traylon has been actively worse than Chig has Chig in a couple of spots has, you know, made some concentration drops and not been as consistent as he should be in blocking with Traylon. He's got the one big, catch in the chargers game and then beyond that you can name more big drops from him than you can even intermediate successes so with burks i i was thinking today you know what has he proven to us as a receiver this year because if you're a wide receiver one you're not a one-trick pony right you're not a you're not a jalen hyatt not to, not to hit jalen hyatt with strays but like 
that's the first one that comes to mind for any of our Tennessee fans. You're somebody that, that is able to be a yak monster and a contested catch winner, or you're an elite route runner and a separator. With Burks, of these five categories, he's really only proven one thing, and is that he can be a vertical threat. And that's really based on that that one catch. But yes. I, I'd say that one big catch is proof enough to me. He, okay, he's capable of doing that. Based on actual plays from him this season on the field on Sundays during a regulation game and not in practices, he has not proven to be a great separator. In fact, he's, he's had pretty poor separation numbers based on what we expect from him. Although you could argue he's, he's a big body receiver. It's not, really, it's not really supposed to be his game. As a prospect, that wasn't really his game. Okay, fine. Doesn't have to be a, a big separator. How about as an elite route runner? Not really, which, was again, wasn't really his game coming out of college. Kind of that DK Metcalf mold of not a great route runner coming out really raw in that respect. Just in year two, he's missed a lot of practice and game reps due to injury. Maybe that stunted his growth. But still, not an elite separator, not an elite route runner. Okay, well, what about what he was built as? Well, he was built as a yak monster. That's been probably the most disappointing element in his game that we've not seen th this year from him. Yards after catch, man, are supposed to be his bag. That's supposed to be money for Traylon Burks. Huge, you know, 6'3", 225, big-bodied guy, capable of breaking tackles. And it seems like at times this year he's been playing with his shoestrings tied. That he is, uh, at, at the first mention of contact, he's going down. Now, I remember a lot last year, early in the season, we are like, man, this must be a yak guy. What's going on? He's not, he's not running through guys. And then by the back half of the year, in that Bengals game, in that Green Bay game, in that Philadelphia game before his concussion, he started to show, okay, maybe it was just a mental thing. He's playing, he's playing stronger. He's playing more confident. We're seeing him break some tackles. This season, he's off to a start like he had last year. We were saying, what's going on? This guy runs into one cornerback who is half his size, and he's brought down with ease. So he's not been a yak monster. He's not been an elite route runner. He's not been a good separator. Okay, the last category, a contested catch winner. He's a big fella. He's got a great vertical. He's athletic. He's big enough to be able to box guys out, especially when he sits down on a route or when he's playing an intermediate route, in-breaking in route. Where is that? Not seen it at all. In fact, in contested catch situations, he has been really, really poor, an active negative for this team. You think back to last game, Tannehill needles a pass in between four defenders across the middle of the field. I target, I highlighted it rather on my, on my Twitter account this week. What's going on there? Got to make catch, hits him in both hands, drops it. Maybe would have been seven points if he hung on to it. And it was going to be a classic AJ Brown running catch in breaking route. It's that kind of thing where you're, you know, you've got it's it's cont contested catches at, at the catch point when he when he's not got separation. We've not seen him make any of those this year. You're seeing him drop balls that he's not contested on more often. Than you're seeing him catch balls that he is contested on. That's not good. So proven to be a downfield vertical threat, he's capable of doing that. But he's not proven to be a good separator. He's not proven to be a, an elite route runner. He's not proven to be a yak monster. And he's not proven to be a contested catch winner. That is incredibly concerning. Now. Unlike Andre Dillard, there's reason to, to have some belief in him in the sense that he has shown us flashes, like I mentioned last year, that Bengals game, that Green Bay game, that Philadelphia game. He's shown that ability to use his speed, strength, and size combination to his advantage and be the guy that we think on paper and in practice that he can be. It's just so far this year he hasn't. This could be a big wake-up game for him in the sense that, like we mentioned earlier in the show, the Bengals pass defense, I'd say pretty average. They are allowing a lot of deep shots. Their their average air yards per per uh, completion allowed, league high ten yards per completion. Maybe this is his get right game. What are you expecting from Burks? I mean, he has had may maybe his second best game. I think Green Bay is his game, his best game that he's played. Definitely, but definitely. I think the second best game that he um, has played in his career came against the Bengals. Um, kind of. Uh, obviously didn't score a touchdown the way you wanted him to score a touchdown <laughs> sure. in that game. Um, but but he was finding success against uh, what what was a completely different Bengal secondary last season. So that, that will also be a big factor. They have a lot that got a lot younger, maybe not as like high level talent as like a Jesse Bates was. Um, for them, but I mean, Dax Hill is playing really good right now. They have a lot of good young guys. Um, Taylor Britt is also playing um, really, really good right now. Right. Um, so I, I think this is the week for him. I think that if there is a week where you might see this passing game start to click, it, it probably has to come against this Bengals team who probably can afford 
um, to give up some of those those opportunities. And I think that's where Burks needs to show up. I, and as I watched the Cleveland game, just kind of encapsulating everything you said, like he just has lacked that. I don't want to like, this is not a real like trait, but like he just lacks the alpha kind of. No, sure. Uh, the, the it is not there. The, the, the it factor mm-hmm. for him is not there. And until he starts making those, those kind of uh, catches, I, I, you just, I, I can't really trust him right now. Right. It's those I'm him moments yes. where, where you like in the chargers game, you see him make that catch. He's fired up. It's like, Oh, there he is. There's that guy. The thing about that, that game icing catch down the, the left sideline going up against, um, which I forget which green Bay defender, um, going up Jair, ag- Jair Alexander. Oh, yeah. Okay. Going up against Jair Alexander in that green Bay game contested catch that ices the game gives them the too small. Like it's those moments that the, the catch where he gets concussed gets absolutely laid out in that Philadelphia game for a touchdown, but hangs onto the ball and makes the catch anyways in traffic. It's those moments that we're, we're lacking from him. They don't have to be that big. You know, they can just be a, a big contested catch on a third down across the middle of the field. And he gets fired. Like that, that it's, it's that kind of alpha. We're not seeing, we've seen it once all year long through three games. We need to see it more. All right. I'm ready to move on to the news, but JT, because it is rivalry week, because you are our, our resident Bengals fan. Is there, I'm going to give you one, one chance here and anything in particular you'd like to say on behalf of your Bengals, anything you're looking forward to seeing from your Bengals that you want to mention before we move on to the news. I mean, I think we covered a lot of it. I think the biggest thing is kind of like you said that, um, like we just touched on that secondary. How are how are they going to to play against this this uh, which I think is probably one of the better wide receiver cores that they've played this season. Um, they played the Rams, which have some emerging stars in Puka Nakua and, and Tutu. The Atwell. best wide receiver in the league. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then they've they've also played uh, the Ravens, who have a developing star, but no real veteran. Like I guess you could say Amari. They've played against Amari Cooper. Um, but no real veteran like, D-Hop, like right. a DeAndre Hopkins. Yep. And, and to your point, circling all the way back, you, you talked about how the Titans have kind of gone away with attacking the middle of the field. And I think that's where the Titans can win this game is by having a standout DeAndre Hopkins performance where you do attack that middle of the field and find success. All right, let's move on to the news with producer JT. We start with the injury report as always. JT, what do we got? Yeah, so let's talk about the guys who did not practice today on Thursday, starting with linebacker Luke Gifford, who is dealing with a hamstring injury. Defensive back Elijah Molden also dealing with a hamstring injury. And then Peter Skaronsky also not practicing still um, with an abdomen as, as it is as it is labeled. And then some other guys who did not practice. Traylon Burks did not practice after practicing limitedly in Wednesdays. He's dealing with a knee injury. He had a um, I, what I big believe rap. a big rap. A lot of people are calling it a serious rap today, um, but it, sure. it, it was it was very uh, noticeable today that he had that on. And then Derek Henry also not practicing today for rest. Which of those guys are you most concerned with not being able to go this week? So let's go through all of them. Skronsky, of course, nothing to mention there. He's going to be out for the foreseeable future. Molden is concerning to me. You know, it's, first of all, I got to preface this: another another week, another Titans Thursday injury report. The Friday report is what tells the tale. Thursdays are the day that they give the most guys rest, the most guys get off. You know, Derrick Henry practicing yesterday. He's off today for rest and still nursing a little bit with that toe. Yesterday, DeAndre Hopkins uh, practices full with that nagging ankle today, limited with that ankle, which to me just – I I don't believe he tweaked it. I just – that reads to me as they're they're load managing it. The the reports that were on site today, which I was not a a part of, they said that he was not out there early on during – position drills so it sounds because he's limited it sounds like he came out for the actual practice the install of that and that's i think you're going to see a lot of that this year um uh derrick henry uh, i mentioned rest not a big deal who, who else am I missing burks here? Uh, burks. yeah one. yeah sorry sorry burks with that knee like friday's friday's gonna tell the tale i i think that he's going to push to play if he can play if that knee was such a big deal that it was really concerning to them that he wasn't going to be able to play i don't think they would have let him practice on it yesterday Maybe it's the case that he was in the position drills when we saw him yesterday, and then because he was listed as limited, that that was because when we went inside and it went to private practice, he went inside as well because he was told or decided it was just, you know, I can't. I, never mind. We thought we could do it today. We can't. I don't know the extent of that. Today feels like it's probably a rest day for him in that knee. We'll see tomorrow. If he's limited or practicing in full, then that'll tell the tale. Um, it wouldn't shock me if he goes into this week with a questionable designation, but at this point, 
I feel like he's going to play in this game. I'm not that concerned about it. Yeah, and then we can talk about some other guys here um, who were limited today. Like you said, DeAndre Hopkins limited. Danico Autry also limited. Um, and then uh, who else? Uh, T.R. Tart is also limited this week. Tart's so, been limited all year. Not yeah. really concerned about that. Hopkins not concerned. Uh, Autry with that groin was – I believe he was in the same boat last week, and then he played. So n- nothing, really the guys that most concern me here are Molden with the hamstring not practicing through two two uh, games – or two, two practices rather. Yes. He he's the one that has the most potentially out uh, possibility here and, for for me. And someone Kenneth brings up asking, is it the same knee that he suffered the injury? At least for Burks, do you, is it the same knee or a different one? Do you know? I don't know for a fact. Thinking in my head about it, seeing it yesterday in person, I want to say that it was, but I'm not sure. Now whether it is the same knee or not, I couldn't tell you for sure whether or not it's still that LCL issue or something new. I'd guess it's probably just a flare up of, of that same thing. I'll, I'll get confirmation on that and tweet about it, Kenneth. That's a good question. But I, I feel like if it was a different knee, we would have heard from folks that were there today talking about it, talking about how it was a different knee. Yeah, and then we can move on to the Cincinnati Bengals side, which Charlie Jones, who has kind of been a pleasant surprise for the Bengals so far this season, has sure. not practiced all week. Tight end Irv Smith also not practicing yet this week with a hamstring, although um, their their practice squad elevation, I don't know his last, first name, but Hudson is his last name, okay. was actually very, very productive in, in his first game there. And then Joe Burrow. Um, the Doc well, Hudson? I, I, I wish. <laughs> sure. I wish. Um, and then Joe Burrow fully participating today without a sleeve on his calf. So it looks like he becomes more and more um, his strength grows every day. single day. Who so. was who was the Bengals receiver last year that low key cooked the team? Was like a really low on the depth chart. You know what I'm talking Trent about? Trent Taylor. Trent, ta- yeah, like, or, or Trenton Irwin. No, Trenton Irwin. Trenton yes. Irwin, big white guy, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trenton Irwin is the guy who came to mind when I watched Charlie Jones earlier this season. Thinking about yes. like Charlie Jones, maybe this year's Trenton Irwin uh, against the Titans. And him not being in there, like, I don't think it's a huge deal because they have three much better receivers than him. But part of me is like, maybe Trey Avery gets some reprieve here and <laughs> and Charlie Jones does not eat his lunch. And with Burrow, yeah, the calf, I'll, I'll be very interested, you know, full participant. Is that is that him just standing around all day and, and truly not moving? You can, you can participate if you're just going to pocket pass her all day long. I, I'm not, certainly I don't think either of us thinks that he's magically going to be much better. I, I think this is the kind of thing where for the next month he's still nursing it and maybe not look if he's lucky, he suffers no setbacks and is back to his full strength in four or five weeks. So I don't think it's that big a deal that he's practicing full. No reason to believe that he's going to suddenly be this uh, mobile savant like like DeAndre, uh, uh, DeAndre Hopkins. Uh, Deshaun, Deshaun Watson. Watson was last week. He's still going to be a statue back there. Yeah, we can move on now to talking about someone who really has gone unnoticed, probably for the better, though, this season. Well, he got a lot of, a lot of play last week. Plenty he did of practice get, a lot of, on he that did on get a lot of practice, but that is the Titans punter, Ryan Stonehouse, who continues to be a stud this season. And um, the, the, the proof is in the pudding by his statistics. His 74-yard punt in week three tied for a career long and is the longest in the league this season. Since the beginning of 2022, he leads the league in 70-plus yard punts with four of them and also leads the league in 60-plus yard punts in that period with 25 of those. Continues to be a, a hidden gem from his draft class um and is continuing to produce for the titans titans i mean just like every every franchise has a position where they're just never in doubt titans and punters never in doubt dude's a stud i hope that this year he continues to play great and get the recognition when award season comes around that he deserves yeah we can move on now to another quick little stat here the titans are on a league best eight game win streak here's your biggest vibes reason to believe that this titans team is going to turn it around right here they are 10 and 2 overall in the past three seasons with a winning percentage of 833 so Mike Vrabel is very good in October. well i saw our buddy Braden gall on a football show earlier today trying to to start mike tober if, mm. if Mike continues to win this October, four seasons in a row, it's just an October machine. Maybe Mike Tober needs to become a thing. You got Mike Tober, you got D Henber, you've got uh, uh, Henu Henuary. I knew there was a January <laughs> January one. Henuary. Um, we are collecting months and memes for this Titans team, but 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 there's. I mean, I think a lot of Titans fans right now are expecting Mike Vrabel to go like one and three in October. One, you know, actually the buys in there, so one and two, zero oh and three. He's going to need to win some of these games. Yes. Uh, let's let's put let's put the number. If he wins two of three in October, 
then we will we'll rock and roll with Mike Tober. Yeah, I'm, I'm, with, I'm with that. Okay. Um, moving on to the other guy on the special teams here, and Nick Folk, who has the active longest active field goal streak. In Another the position the Titans just never in doubt. <laughs> field goal kicker. Having made his last eight attempts as a Patriot and his first eight attempts as a Titan, continues to have the best uh, start to a season for a Titan since 2015 with Ryan Suckup. So continues to be automatic for him. It's hilarious to me that they send this out in the media this week because I'm pretty confident that this is going to be a classic media jinx of him as kicker. Yes. The fact that we all blasted out everybody in the media pool talking about how oh he hasn't missed in 16. Okay, well, he's going to he's going to have a 33 yard attempt to take a lead for the Titans. You know, this here's my prediction for this week. Okay, Titans offense comes out with fire in their fire in their gut, Arizona Cardinals style. Yes. They march down the field and have the first the first week you know the on the season really where their opening drive they have some real momentum. They get down, they get stopped in the red zone. Fine, no big deal. Promising first drive, 34, 35 yard chip shot for Nick Folk, and then the, the media jinx misses, and then the, everybody in the stadium just turns white. It's like here we go. It's gonna be one of those. <laughs> We can move on now um, to talk a little bit more sacks here or stats here, not sacks. NFL teams have allowed have allowed a sack only 6.1% of their touchdown drives this season. In related news, the Titans have allowed a sack on 36% of their drives. I ran the, the numbers, checks out. Turns the, out the uh, Titans have been sacked a lot and have scored many, a very few touchdowns. Yes. So that, that checks out. Um, it's the second highest rate in the league currently. So something that they will try to change this week. And then finally, Uncle Jimmy back with his wardrobe check for Rich's report. What we got? Um, the Titans will be decked out in all navy blue jerseys, britches, and socks in mm. Sunday's game versus the Bengals. A classic look, a refined look. I like it. All right, that is JT with the news, and that brings us to our final segment of the day, the best bet gauntlet. JT, it has been a for the show very good year, and for you in particular, a very good year. Now, Indeed. as somebody that is uh, responsible and takes 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 ownership of of their actions. It's been a it, it's certainly not a disaster. I'm one game under 500. I am uh, what am I sitting at? 8 and 7, 7 and 8. No, 8 7 and 8, I believe. Yes. 7 and 8 through 3 weeks. 19 and uh, 11 for the show. 19 and 11 on the show. You're hard carrying. I, I do I appreciate that. You know, I did have to carry pretty much all last year. So I appreciate, you know, ever all good things must come to an end. Yes. And I'm not somebody that's going to dwell on the past and point to my past Super Bowl rings. So like I appreciate you doing that. I, I am glad ultimately that the show is doing well. That is the number one thing for us. 19 and 11, north of 60%, a ridiculous number that's probably going to regress to the mean, but we're going to try like hell to not let it regress to the mean. And this week's board, I feel really good about. I'm ready to get back on my horse. You're on a heater. You are nine and nine and one in your last. 10 picks. Yes. So we're looking to keep you on that heater and I'm looking to join you. Um, let's get into this week's picks. And as I am the week, a week th three loser, two weeks in a row, I get the first pick. Um, I'm going with, with this week, one of my favorite, actually not one of it's the first pick. So it is my favorite. Yes. My favorite <laughs> bet of the week. Uh, well, I say that because we are going head to head on a game that I'm guessing let's, let's, the cats out of the back. Okay. It's the rivalry yes. week. I'm taking the Titans. He's taking the Bengals. We'll talk about it at the end. So it's really four picks from each of us. Um, I love the Titans pick, and I'm going to talk to you about Mike why Grable, that is home later. Dog, who's gutsy enough? Both of us. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, but my second favorite pick is this Buffalo Bills team. How do you not fade a team that just scored 70 points in week no, three? Good question. Okay. Ask Cowboys fans how easy it is to get caught up drinking the Kool-Aid on your team in September and for all of it to come crashing down. Now, I don't think they're going to have a, a Cowboys-esque performance in week four against Buffalo, but there is a ton of signal pointing to why you have to take this Buffalo team. Two has been pressured a league low eight times this season. Just eight pressures on the year through three games. Zero sacks allowed. He's been kept completely clean. This is the first great pass rush that he's playing. He has not faced very much in terms of pressure. His offensive line, credit to them, they've done a good job. But in terms of the, the assignment they've been given to keep Tua clean, it's been pretty lackluster. This is going to be a big step up in class. I trust Sean McDermott, head coach of the Bills, to they trust him against Tua. I think that the, the you know the divisional familiarity comes into play here. I looked this up. Tua it has a 59 quarterback ranking against the Bills, uh, career long, and this line has not moved. That's another thing that, that is interesting to me. It's been Buffalo minus two and a half all week long. Part of me thought that it would come. My, Miami my money would come in. The, the, the pros in Vegas would start to give this more of a pick'em line. It's not. It's still Buffalo. 
as almost a field goal favorite. I kind of think that it would have moved if if Vegas and the pros felt that Miami was truly this cannot be stopped juggernaut team. Some other numbers for you: teams that manage six plus yards per play, averaging six or more yards per play through three games, are 35, 56, and one, which is 38 percent in their fourth game historically. It's time to come back down to earth for this this Miami offense. And uh, Miami is just they, you go back and you look at what they've done this year. Yes, the offense has been fantastic, but they've dominated two bad defenses in Denver and L.A. OK, Sam Howell hung 32 points on the Denver defense. OK, last week against this Bills defense, Sam Howell hung zero points. So that that right there is a microcosm example of how much of a difference this is going to be. The final stat, maybe the most important, a fantastic sample size of one teams that have scored 70 points or more in a game in NFL history or 0-1 against the spread in the following week, which is a very, very good <laughs> signal, very good sample size, very effective stats. So all day long, I'm, I'm betting Buffalo minus 2.5. I love this. You have to be fearless to bet against this juggernaut Miami offense, but I'm doing it. Yeah, and then Shrike here in the comments says, are you saying that he should start Howell over Tua this week in fantasy football? Uh, yes, that's exactly, exactly what we're saying. Yes, start Howell and prosper. Yeah. <laughs> Don't my, my, my first pick in this week's uh, best bet gauntlet week four edition. I'm going with Tampa Bay plus three and a half. I'm mad you took this because I like this bet. Uh, New Orleans. Um, let's talk about, first of all, why this probably isn't a good pick, and then I'll tell you why it is a good pick. The Bucks, okay. uh, obviously, um, kind of a polarizing team this year. They they sure. are, are kind of They're a big pros through, team. Big yes, pros team. Uh, through expectations. But the Bucks had the longest against the spread road losing streak in the NFL entering the season, which was six games in a row. And then they covered and won on the road in Minnesota in week one. Um, Tampa is 6-12 and 12 against the spread on the road since the start of 2021. Mm. It's the second worst mark in the NFL just ahead of the Bears. However, this is uh, not something that's super scaring me this week because obviously Jameis Winston is looking to get the start over Derek Carr since he's yep. injured. Um, and it, it's been tough for Jameis Winston as a starter um, and being the favorite. Winston has been a tough bet as an underdog, um, he he's been eight, 19 and one as the favorite. So against the spread. So I'm, I'm looking to fade Jameis Winston and this team. Also, it is just the, the NFC South matchup of NFC South matchups that always just feels like it ends yep. in the field goal. So with getting that hook, I really do like the plus three and a half. It, it's an auto bet simply because it's a divisional matchup. You're getting the hook with the dog. You, you take the dog. That's yes. two teams that are close in a division. You take the dog. Some more numbers just to support where you're going, because I'm betting this as well, even though you're taking it in the competition. Jameis is 8, 19, and 1 against the spread, all time as a favorite, which is 30%. As a favorite of over a field goal, he's 2 and 9 ATS. So, like, this guy is not a front runner. It's a bounce back spot for Tampa Bay. This, 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 uh, this New Orleans team, every game they've played this year has, has finished within three points, win or lose. Everything points to taking this Tampa Bay number at three and a half. For my second pick in the week four best bet gauntlet, give me the Rams plus one and a half at Indianapolis. I think the Rams win this game outright. First of all, it's it's a it's a good zig while the, the public zag spot. LA coming off of a primetime loss. Typically, that means that team's going to be a little bit undervalued by the market. Indy, a big upset win against the Rams. I think that this is a good bounce back spot for the Rams. Come down to earth moment for the, 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 uh, the Colts. This is the biggest individual luck rankings differential of the week, according to the Action Network's luck rankings, which tracks stuff like dropped passes, turnover luck, bounce, you know, just bounces that go your way, things that are that are really luck based in a game, and and that following that that metric where the luck rankings are significantly different in a game is, I think it's like sixty five percent all time over three or four years. So it's a it's a winning indicator. Um, one thing that that is really interesting to me about these two teams that I think is another great indicator why you should take the Rams in this game. The Rams have outgained opponents in each of their games so far this year by an average of 83 yards per game. The Colts have been outgained in all three of their games this year. They 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 are two and one, but they've been outgained th outgained three times by an average of 45 yards per game. So I think that this Rams team is going to show that 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 you know you can't consistently be outgained and win. I think it's a bounce back spot for them. I think they win. Um, outright. Give me the Rams plus one and a half at Indy. For my second pick, and as Kenneth says in here, Stroud is on a heater. Steelers offense is go garbage. Texans, sneaky good bet. Good hmm. pick, Kenneth. Hmm, good good pick, pick because that's exactly where I'm going. I'm Love taking it. Houston 
this week. Plus three, like he said, Stroud is on a heater. He's one of two quarterbacks still in the league to not have thrown an interception this season. Dare I say he's the better quarterback in this matchup? He is maybe I think, yeah, right now I think the he better is. quarterback. Um, and with with this, there are, are a couple trends that I do like. Tomlin, Mike Tomlin, that being, hasn't had success on a road trip recently. Week four in Houston is their second straight road game that they've had. Since 2018, the Steelers are 3-7 and seven against the spread on the second or later leg of a road trip. Interesting. The only co- coaches that are worse are Bill O'Brien, Kevin Stefanski, and Doug Marone. Throwback there. Um, but yeah, like he said, I think this team is starting to play a lot better. That offensive line, despite not really having a lot of their starters really hasn't faltered that much. CJ Stroud looks confident, even though pressure, no pressure. It's pressure, not really no, yeah, Despite, him. despite yeah. the pressure that he's getting, he's looked really good and getting them at the underdog plus three home dogs. Love it. I'm taking them. It's a classic Tomlin loss spot as well, as much as Tomlin wins and is a great bet- betting tail just in general. He's a favorite on the road, just won twice um in games that he probably should have lost he's got the ravens a divisional foe coming up next week another number for you tom one as a road favorite is 15 25 and one which is 40 percent ats in his in the in mike tom era so i love that bet i love houston plus three for my third bet in the best bet gauntlet week four give me jacksonville in their home away from home the london game minus three versus atlanta um a couple of reasons why i love this jacksonville team here they were outgained by, or excuse me, they outgained Houston last week despite losing. So that was kind of a fluky, misleading final score. They just could not cash in with points, which is a problem for sure. But I think that there's going to be some regression there. This is a team that looks like they've read their their press clippings during the offseason. I think that they bounce back in a big way um, in this game against a an Atlanta team that does a really good job on offense on the ground. Jacksonville is a top three team in MP- in EPA and success rate against the rush so far this year. So I think that they're going to take away that running game of Atlanta to an extent that they're forced to pass the ball. And Desmond Ritter has been tremendously disappointing to me. I had some faith in him going into the year. I feel foolish for having that faith. He he it looks like he's not a dude. He's, it looks like he's not real. I I frankly I I don't know what to expect from him. It looks like Arthur Smith has no faith in him. I think that Jacksonville wins this game outright by a touchdown. Yeah, I like that pick, especially um, where the Jacksonville Jaguars this week are playing uh, home away from home. That's right. And especially it's the Toy Story animation game this week. So how can you not have <laughs> a you favorite not? on that I one? forget what the record is in London, but it's very good. I think they have the best the best winning record in London of all the teams that have played there. Yeah, so moving on now um, with my third pick here of the best bet gauntlet. Um, I'm taking Baltimore plus three as a uh, underdog against Cleveland. Once again, I think we a, bet Baltimore every week, like bet on the Baltimore game every week. Pro- I season. think so. But they, I mean, there's good reason to do it yeah. because they have been underdogs in a lot of these games. And Lamar Jackson, as an underdog, uh, as an underdog hits against the spread 84.6% of the time. In it is the highest in the last 20 years for a quarterback with at least 10 starts as an underdog. My goodness, you're right. 11 and two ATS is yes. a dog. Lamar Jackson. Um, the, the only, the only guy who's done it better, Patrick Mahomes. Like this, this is a guy who um, keeps this team in this in in games. He's a p- dynamic playmaker. I like this spot where this Cleveland team is really riding high. But if there's somebody who's going to know how to match up against this Cleveland team, it's Harbaugh and the Ravens. I think it's going to be a close game, and I'll take the points plus. Well, it's a buy low high side buy low sell high. sell high. Thank you, you. Spot for these two teams, right? Yes. Cleveland coming off of a butt whooping at Tennessee. Baltimore getting embarrassed by the Colts. I think that this is the right spot for sure to bet the Ravens. My fourth pick in the week four best bet gauntlet. Give me the Green Bay Packers tonight. You only have about, uh, what, 30 minutes, 30-ish minutes yeah. to bet this game. But give me Green Bay plus two and a half versus Detroit tonight on Thursday Night Football. I bet against Detroit a couple of times this year as, as much as I love Detroit. <laughs> so far, that everything's pointing to betting against Detroit for me so far. I don't want to do it, but I got to do it. Some of the indicators here. LaFleur, as a home dog. 16 and 4 ATS, 13 and 7 straight up. So an auto bet right there. Jared Goff outdoors, concerning. He's got a concerning record outdoors in the elements. Not to say that this is going to be December Lambo out there, but that is concerning to me that, that he's playing outdoors in the elements up there in Lambo. Green Bay getting when was the last time that the Lions were favored in a game with the Green Bay Packers in Lambo when the Green Bay was starting their starting quarterback, quarterback? 
I, I bet it's been like 20 years. I saw there. This stat was out here. Oh, wait, I, I, was I saw it? this okay. stat. I think it was on Pat McAfee actually today. So I'll have to go and look at this. It's been a long show. time. I'm it's sure. It's been though. a very okay. long time. Yeah, um, Green Bay getting but, some key players back yes. as well. Christian Watson coming back. Christian oh, Watson and Aaron Jones and, will be in yep. this game. David Bakhtiari actually went on IR right. um, earlier today. So not going to have him. Um, Wasn't expecting him anyways. So yeah, yeah, like having those two guys back is big for the offense. Give me Green Bay to win by a field goal. Um, I, actually, I think that they're going to win outright, but I think they'll win by probably a, eh, it'd be close. This is a divisional game. I'll give them win by a field goal, uh, but Green Bay to cover plus two and a half versus Detroit. Yeah, with my next pick here before we get into um, our, 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 be, our matchup of the week, I'm taking, and this is one, I don't love it, but okay. uh, it's just like, it, I was looking at the board. There's a couple it's other scary, ones. It's but you scary. Gotta, you got to trust the process. I do one. have to, you, you did. Uh, tell me to trust the process when I came to you with this one, but I'm taking the Jets plus nine and a half. If I can get it to double digits, that's even You're better. You're going to get the 10. And I By think, Sunday, the public's going to think it's an auto bet. You're going to get the 10. There's no way. So wait for the 10 is, yeah. the, is the message here. Wait for the 10. And, and here, here's why. Just one, one fact that I really do like about this game. Mahomes as a double digit favorite, if it does in fact get there, he's 22 and two straight up. So yep. I'm not, he not, wins the games. He wins the games. However, he is not very good at covering nope. 10, 13, and 1 against the spread. This offense, this Jets offense, is not good with Zach Wilson. Um, however, this Jets defense is still one of the better defenses in the league. Very good defense. I'm expecting after the the I, the pomp and circumstance of the Taylor Swift <laughs> game where they absolutely routed sure. the Chicago Bears, yeah. I'm expecting them to come back down to earth despite taylor uh, the report saying taylor swift will be there at metlife this week hilarious that her exposure to football starts with playing the bears playing the jets it's all downhill from here i, mean, I, I would it's agree be, i would agree it's but, gonna be less um that's too many points easy. for my for my blood. uh for my blood there two reasons that i like this bet that i had written down in case you didn't take this i i have heard from two different pro betters and i'm not in the pro betting space enough to know who this group is but these pro betters have said it this week there's a very smart and respected professional cabal, professional group um, that is coming in very, very heavily on this just position. The of betting. The genuinely, these professional groups that come in, they hit like five to seven teams really hard each year, and they win 90% of those bets. When they hit them hard, they know something. These big groups, this big group in particular, is hitting this Jets team big in this spot, and that's usually a signal to bet, bet, bet. Another thing is, this is the most public, according to Action Network, it's the most public side of the week by a huge margin, betting on this Kansas City team. People are seeing this as an auto bet, free money. They think they're going to they're gonna beat the, the Jets just as badly as they beat the Bears. Maybe they will, but odds are that they won't. How often do you see Vegas take a bath like this? Last I checked, 16, just 16% of the bets were on this Jets side, meaning if the Jets don't cover, Vegas is going to take a bath. They always manage to make their money, right? How often do you see them just get killed? Not very. So I'm gonna I'm gonna roll with Vegas knows something. This professional group knows something. I'll be betting that along with you. All right, let's get to our last bets here. I'm taking Tennessee plus two and a half. You're taking Cincinnati minus two and a half. Is that the best number I, you got? Did you get a better number? I'm currently at two and a half. Okay, two and I, a half. I, I I didn't get it. I didn't get it at the underdog because of course it, it, wasn't, it was before. It was on it was, Monday was before on the, Monday. the lines came out. And you know, Kenneth, you just got to keep the faith, man. He's quite. He's like. JT, what are you doing? Is someone, somebody besides Zach Kenneth, Wilson listen, playing? The P, the, you got to trust the pros. You got to trust the process they right know. now. 12 and 3, I'm on a heater. I like my picks this week. That's right. Um, you just got to trust the You've process. You've built up the equity to I take some so. swings. I think so. You know, it's I one did. loss. You're still at 70%. Like, yeah. it's not the end of the world. All right. So I'm taking Tennessee plus two and a half. And here's why. JT, I Mike know. Mike Rabel as the underdog. I'm not going to mention that. We know. I've said it every week. Mike Rabel is an underdog. Home dog is an auto bet. We know this. He's, he's got a winning record as a home underdog. Okay. Yes. I know you've seen this and I know it's concerning you. Every pro better in the world this week is licking their chops. They smell blood in the water. This is the favorite bet of the week. Favorite home dog of the week of every professional better worth their salt out there. Okay. I've been seeing them salivating over this game. Here's some signal for you. Teams who score three or less points. The previous week, which the Titans scored three in Cleveland, those teams are 77, 58, and four, 57% against the spread the following week. You look at the, dis uh, the disparity between tickets and money. The public, 29% of the tickets are on the, on the Titans, just 29% of the public betters are on the Titans. 
66% of the money, the big money betters, is on the Titans. It's a plus 37% differential. Typically very, very good signal indicative of betting the home dog. Mike Rabel, like I said, home dog, auto bet. Betting against the public, this is, a, this is an action network systems tracker. This system tells me that betting against the public after a blowout performance, blowout loss like the Titans had, is 61% all time, which the Titans fit that criteria. I asked to do the commanders, by the way, this week. If you feel like if you're feeling gutsy on the commanders, I guess go for that because they, the, they meet that criteria as well. But all of those reasons tell me Tennessee going to cover plus two and a half. This is a great home spot for them. I think that they win the game out. I agree with for the show. You kind of have to. You, you is this, are we adding this to the vibes pick yes, category? Yes, I was about okay, to say. All right, all right. My reasoning, this is the second J certified JT, producer JT vibes pick of the year. Okay. We're 1-0 and so far on, my, on our vibes picks. This is true. Um, I, I'm not doubting that it's going to be a close game. However, if the line was like three, I probably would stay away from it. Just getting them under the, the, the field goal right there. This feels like, like it could come down to a field goal in this game. Um, like it has so many times before, um, with, with this matchup. And I do think that maybe money Mac just comes back and has, is, uh, takes his rightful place on the sofa. That is <laughs> Nissan stadium okay, again. Okay. Um, so it, it, it's going to be a close game. Like I, I don't win. hate either side of this bet. I just think that this game is going to be very, very close this week. And at the field goal, obviously you're going to take the Titans. I still feel pretty confident that this is a fine bet, even though, hey man, the, sometimes forty the, percent of the time the pros are stupid. Yes, and that's kind of, of what I've been living on you so been, far, and I've been making it, money. Been so let's see if I channel Icarus this week. Or and, do you uh, float, fly, too, I close fly to the sun. too close to the sun? We'll see. All right. To recap the best bet gauntlet for week four, JT taking one favorite, Cincinnati minus two and a half, a road favorite at Tennessee. It's four dogs. The Jets plus nine and a half. Wait for that 10 versus Kansas City. Baltimore plus three at Cleveland. Houston plus three versus the Pittsburgh Steelers. And Tampa Bay plus three and a half getting the hook at New Orleans. I'm taking two favorites. Give me Jacksonville minus three. They're home away at home. Home away from home in London against Atlanta. Buffalo minus two and a half versus Miami. And then three dogs, Tennessee plus two and a half as a home dog against Cincinnati. Green Bay plus two and a half as a home dog against Detroit. And the Rams, a road dog of one and a half at the Indianapolis Colts. That is our best bet gauntlet. And that is and our one, show. And one more bet. Oh, I, I think because oh? we do have some people in the comments who are going to be very mad if we don't do this. Okay. And I do think it's kind of funny okay. to do. Logan Grady wants a boom boss beer bet so bad here. A beer. So what do we need to do? So, so we take, we take one side of the line or one, we both just make a bet on the Thursday night on game, the Thursday night game. Okay. And I give you, I'll give you a lock that I really like this week. Okay. That I need to take um, the opposite of. You don't have to. Okay, I, I, what do you we'll, propose? I'm just, I'm going to put this out here as a lock this week. Okay. On the All right. Boom boss beer bet. It. Pay for your drinks tonight, okay. wherever you are. Hopefully you're at boom boss, but uh, wherever you are, hopefully you pay your drinks tonight with this one. I'm taking uh, Luke Musgrave over 35 and a half yards receiving yards. And I'm also taking the over in targets at three and a half right now. This Detroit team has given up the third most yards to tight ends this season. Luke Musgrave, despite Christian Watson coming back has been targeted a lot in this offense. He's getting a good connection with Jordan love. I like that bet tonight. So 35 and a half yards for Musgrave. I have put zero effort or thought into this and i'll just for the for the love of the game i'll take the under why not i'll okay. take the under we'll see who has to buy somebody a beer tonight that's our boom boss beer bet we'll prepare for that better next week thank you for reminding us on that logan all right now we're done appreciate everybody <laughs> being with us we ran a little bit long today but that's how it goes here at boom boss cannot wait to pack up and head over to the bar grab that drink and watch this thursday night football game should be a good one make sure you're subscribed at our broadway sports media youtube page like we said broadway sports media on youtube hit that subscribe button it's free helps us helps us out a lot consider it a personal favor if you do that for us make sure you're following us on social media at hot read pod on twitter on tiktok on instagram great show content going up there more and more as the season rolls along until monday uh sunday evening live when we are recapping titans Bengals, whatever the result may be we will talk to you then. Make sure to come tune in with us live to either celebrate a breaking the Bengals curse or panic that the Titans are dropping to one and three. We'll be there uh, usually usually in the round halftime of Sunday Night Football for folks that are wondering. Sunday Night Football halftime, come tune in, talk, talk Titans with us. Until then, for producer JT, I'm your host, Easton Freeze. This has been the Hot Read Podcast. We'll talk to you next week.